this morning when my heart filled up and uh, I thoroughly enjoyed studying this morning and had such a blessing in there. Usually it doesn't come out as good as I get it and so I hope that this will be a blessing. i tell you what I've done this morning. I want everybody to look up here for just a minute. There are some of you that are looking at me right now. Look at me, everybody. They're lost. And I've prayed for you this morning. And I'm praying that God will convict your heart this morning, show you what he's done for you, and that you'll, you'll come this morning and be saved. And I hope you've done the same. I believe somebody done some praying this morning. The Lord showed up and was here and uh, blessed us real good. And we need that visitation. We need the Lord to be here and uh, speak to hearts. I want you to listen to me. Every teenager, I want you to listen. I want you to turn with me in your Bible as I turn, and I want you to listen to God's Word. It's important that you do that this morning. And so let's look at Matthew chapter 27, and we'll start in verse 27, and we'll all stand while we read God's precious holy Word. If you're there, say amen. Amen. Verse 27 says, Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the common hall and gathered unto him the whole band of soldiers. Now we've been preaching a lot on that. And they stripped him and put on him a scarlet robe. And when they had plaited a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head and a reed in his hand, right hand, and they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail! King of the Jews. And they spit upon him and took the reed and smote him on the head. And after that they had mocked him, they took the robe off him and put his own raiment on him and led him away to to crucify him. And as they came out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. Him they compelled to bear his cross. When they were coming to a place called Golgotha, that is to say the place of, a place of a skull, they gave him vinegar to drink mingled with gall, and when, they, when he had tasted thereof, he would not drink. And they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture... Did they cast lots? And sitting down, they watched him there and set up over his head his accusation written, This is Jesus, King of the Jews. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to come and preach this gospel message. And I pray, God, that you'd speak through me. And and I pray, God, that you'd speak to those that are here. Give us unction to preach and power to preach. And I pray, God, that you'd uh, use me like you never have before. And I pray, God, that we get outside of ourselves, uh, Lord, and, uh, and uh, we uh, realize that we need to be hid behind the cross. And, Lord, that folks need to see Jesus. And I pray, God, that you would help us now, guide and direct us, speak to hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to bring a message this morning on blessed truths from the robes that Jesus wore. I want you to pay special attention before he changes here. Let me, let, me, let me show you something. Look in verse 35. The Bible says, And they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. Now, I want you to pay special attention here. They parted my garments among them, and then they say this, And upon my vesture... Did they cast lots? There are written in the Bible uh, four robes that Jesus wore before the cross. Now, there's five robes in the scripture that talks that Jesus actually wore. But there was four robes before the cross that Jesus wore. Now, those robes are blessed truths to the saved person. They're blessed truths to the lost person because Jesus wore those robes for a reason. Now let me say this to you. One thing we can truly say that Satan is good at is uh, to um, uh, uh, overstep his boundaries. 
he, he tries to make everything bad. And so as we look at these robes, we're going we're gonna to look at them, and the, 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 Satan and his crew looked at them and said, Boy, this is bad, this is bad. But God overruled him, amen? And God takes these garments and shows us some things about our Savior as he walked toward the cross, amen? And so God wants to make what Satan did to hinder a blessing. Now, take John the, uh, the Apostle for example. John the Apostle was saved, they say, history says, at an early age, maybe even as a teenager. He was saved as a young person. We don't know how old he was uh, when he came off the boat, but he lived uh, near 100 years. He was the only apostle that wasn't martyred, not because they didn't try, because of his testimony's sake, uh, they took him, boiled him in oil, and put him over on the Isle of Patmos. They tried their best to kill him, but you know what? God had different plans, and God overruled in John's life. And John wanted him to take dictation for the Holy Spirit to write the book of Revelation. And so God overruled the Satan in that area, and, uh, and God had his will and his way in his life. So Satan's good at trying to overstep his boundaries, Brother Don, and he'll make others think that he has right to be there. But God overrules. Amen. Now, could you imagine as Jesus is on the cross and as he's going to the cross, the conversation maybe that uh, Satan uh, and uh, death and hell had uh, and the grave had as they were there uh, and Jesus was dying on the cross, Satan thought that he had him. He thought, well, we've got him. Uh, he's, uh, he's pinned down. We've, uh, we've stepped into an area where now I imagine Satan was standing there and said, now I'm going to be sovereign. Now I'm going to be the one that everybody looks to. But thank God he overruled. On that third day, Jesus got up from that tomb and was victorious over death, hell, and the grave. And, and so he, uh, he stepped into boundaries and over his boundaries, and God always overrules. Brother, I'm sorry if you can't keep up. Uh, that's all right. Just change it when you feel like you need to. Amen. Amen. Now, I believe this morning, I believe uh, God wants to save someone from hell. I, I, believe God wants to, I believe God wants to overrule Satan this morning. And I believe he wants to uh, have, have victory this morning. I also believe that Satan has overstepped his boundary. I believe that he's told someone, you just sit there and listen. You just sit there and don't pay attention. This has nothing to do with you. But I believe God can overrule this morning. And I believe that God can win some soul to the Lord if you'll just listen. Amen? Now, there's four robes that we find in the Scripture that Jesus wore uh, before He went to the cross and as He was going to the cross. And in those four uh, uh, robes, we see that three of those robes were placed on Him to mock Him. They were placed on him to mock him. And I'm going to show you at the end of this how ignorant they were that God was overruling in every bit of it. And the last one that he wore uh, on this earth before he went to the cross speaks a very wonderful, beautiful truth to us. And he wore it on purpose. Amen. And so I want to show you those four, four robes. I've never preached this before and I'm excited about it. And I want to show you those four robes this morning. And, and they emphasize the truth to us about the old rugged cross and what Jesus did for us. Amen? The first one was the scarlet robe. And you'll find that in Matthew chapter 27. We read just a few minutes ago. Matthew chapter 27 and verse number 28. The Bible says, And they stripped him and put on him a scarlet robe. Now, the color scarlet speaks of a sacrifice. That word scarlet uh, is a deep, deep red. It's a, it's a red that goes beyond red. It, there's no other color like scarlet. And so scarlet uh, speaks of death. And it describes, uh, the Bible describes in the, in, in the scripture, the Bible describes our sin being as scarlet. Now listen to this. Isaiah chapter 1 verse number 18. Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord, though your sins be as scarlet. They shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Now listen to me. I believe you need to understand something this morning. Your sin is going to cause death to you. The Bible says that 
death cometh by sin. And, uh, and uh, sin is going to cause you to eternally die forever. The Bible says there's none righteous, no, not one. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And God already said in His Bible in Isaiah chapter 1 verse 18 that your sin to God is as scarlet. Scarlet. Now, I want you to understand something that, that, that scarlet. Uh, Jesus said this in Psalms chapter 22 and verse number 6. He said, But am a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despised of the people. Now this is Jesus dying on the cross and he proclaimed himself to be a worm. That not just any worm, but a specific worm, the Tola worm. That worm, that Tola worm was used in Jerusalem and all about the world. They take that worm and they crush it. They, I mean it takes millions and millions of them and they crush it. And from the, the secretion of that worm comes the color scarlet. Now, I'm going to give you something that just blessed my soul. I've preached on that worm many times. But as they take that, that scarlet color, Brother Gary, and they dip that robe or that garment down into that scarlet and it dyes that garment, guess what happens to it? It becomes permanent. It cannot be removed. It's permanent. And I'm going to tell you something. When Jesus wore that scarlet robe, it said, I'm fixing to die for sin. I'm fixing to take sin out of the picture. And what I do, it'll be permanent. Amen. And listen to me. They can't cut out my salvation once I got saved. I'm eternally, wonderfully, always saved. Amen. And what he did on that cross, he did it permanent. It cannot be tore out, can't be washed out, can't be taken away. And so that scarlet robe that he wore as they were mocking him and Satan was overstepping his boundaries, God overruled and said, let him wear that scarlet robe because that's what he's fixing to do is shed his blood on that cross for your sin and for my sin. Amen? Now, it's possible for a person to sin after they get saved. Would you say amen to that? But I'll tell you what, it, it may be possible, but after you get saved, sin ain't the same to you anymore. You have no desire to sin. And when you do sin, it bothers you and, and drives you back to the cross where you see the permanent, uh, the, the permanent sacrifice that Jesus made on that cross. And I'm going to tell you something, there was a cost to that. It was His blood, His precious crimson blood flowed from that cross and He put that blood on the mercy seat for you and I and then when we got saved it became permanent to us and I've got news for you his blood's not old his blood's not uh, 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 coagulated his blood is still flowing his blood is still real and you can still come it's permanent and you can come and get saved this morning Amen and so when they put that scarlet robe on him to mock him, uh, listen to me, the Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18 and 19, For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation uh, received by tradition of your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Amen. I was reading this morning and I was studying and I found this uh, in the... Uh, in, uh, in England, the British Navy rope. I don't know about here, but in, in Britain, the Navy rope that they use uh, to anchor ships and, to, and any, everything they use it for. If you cut that in half, there's a scarlet thread that runs through the middle of it. And, and any time you cut that in two, you'll know that it's a British Navy rope. And can I tell you something from the book of Genesis all the way to the book of Revelation? There's a, there's a scarlet thread that runs through that Bible that lets us know that Jesus, hey, he, he died for us. Amen. He wanted to redeem us and He wants to redeem you this morning. Amen. Amen. Second one, the second robe that He wore is found in Luke chapter 23. Look there if you would. Turn there in your Bible if you would. Luke chapter number 23 and verse number 11. The Bible says, are you there? Say amen. Nobody there yet. Are you there now? Amen. And Herod with his men of war set him at naught and mocked him. There's a mock again. And arrayed him in a gorgeous robe and sent him again to Pilate. Now, 
Here is the second one. It is a gorgeous robe. The first one was a scarlet robe that spoke of the sacrifice that he made on the cross. The, the deep darkness of our sin was taken away by the, his precious blood. Now, the second robe is called the gorgeous robe. History says this robe was a dazzling white robe, bright white robe. And uh, it speaks of his priesthood. It speaks of his priesthood. Now listen to this. Uh, our Savior was about to enter into a place where no one else could enter. He was about to enter into a place where no one else could enter. Leviticus, Leviticus chapter number 16 verse 4. He shall put on the holy linen coat, talking of the high priest. He shall have the linen breeches upon his flesh and shall be girded with a linen girdle. And with the linen miter shall he be attired. These are holy garments. Amen. Therefore shall he wash his flesh in water and so put them on. Hebrews chapter 9 verse number 12. Neither by the blood of goats and calves but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place having obtained eternal redemption for us. And now brother Don they put on this bright dazzling white garment on him this robe on him and they were mocking him and making fun of him. Little did they know that on that third day he would rise from that tomb and take his precious blood and put it on the mercy seat before God a place where you and I could not go but he took it there and put it on that mercy seat for you and I and he became our high priest making intercession for us hallelujah and when we see that second robe we see not only did he die for our sins but he rose to live for us and be our high priest He's the only high priest we have, friend. He's sitting on the right hand of the Father and the Bible says all that we have, we have through Him. Amen. Our prayers go to Him. Our, listen to me, our hope is in Him. He, we're anchored behind the veil because He sat down on the right hand of the Father. Amen. Amen. So we see in that blessed second robe, we see not only in the scarlet robe, but we see in the shining bright white robe, we see our Savior as our high priest. Now, I would like for you to turn to John chapter 19. John chapter 19, look in verses 2 and 3, and then we're going to jump down to 5. And I want you to see this purple robe. That's the third one, the purple robe. The Bible says in, in verse number 2, And the soldiers planted a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they put on him a purple robe and said, Hail, King of the Jews. And they smote him with their hands. Verse number 5 says, Then came Jesus forth, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate saith unto him, Behold the man. Now, this purple robe speaks of Jesus in his kingship. We find him in the scarlet robe as the Lamb of God, the sacrifice for all men. Then we find him in that white robe as the one who uh, rose from the dead and put that sacrifice before God uh, in heaven. Then we find in the third part the purple robe and we find his kingship. Purple stood for royalty. And uh, when someone was wearing purple, meant they had all the money they wanted and they were king or they were someone of royalty. And I thank God, listen to me, they mocked him and said they put a sign over him and said, you said you was the king of the Jews. But friend, I got news for you. He's not just the king of the Jews. He's the king of kings and lord of lords. And one of these days, he's going to come back and take what was lost. Amen. Revelation chapter number 19. I like this chapter. The Bible says in verse number 11, And I saw heaven open, and behold a white horse. And he that sat on, upon him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were a flame of fire, and upon his head were many crowns. Hallelujah. And he made a name uh, uh, written. He had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp two-edged sword, and with it sh uh, he should smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, 
King of kings and Lord of lords. Amen. This speaks of the rightful ownership that the Lord has to all that was His. Amen. Listen to me. Sin came into this world. Adam lost everything to sin. But the Bible says Jesus is that second Adam that would come back and reclaim everything that was lost. If you'll read the book of Revelation rightly, you'll find that there's going to come a time when He raptures out the church. The Bible says He says, Come up hither. One of these days we're going to hear that shout, that trumpet sound and we're going to go up hither. Amen. And then while we're up hither, he's going to uh, uh, pour out his wrath upon this earth. And the Jews will understand that he was the Messiah the first time. And they'll, the Bible says they'll come to him. Many of them will come to him and be saved. Amen. But then the Bible says the heavens is going to open up. He's going to come back and claim it all back. Amen. And when he wore that royal robe, they were mocking him. They put a crown of thorns on his head and a, and a reed, little weed in his hand. And they smote him on top of the head. But friend, I got news for you. When he comes back that second time and he comes back to rule and reign on this earth, he won't be wearing a crown of thorns and he won't be holding a reed in his hand. He'll be coming coming back to claim it once and for all. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Now, I want to get to this. The fourth one. Turn to John chapter 19 again and look in verse number 23. The Bible says, Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took His garments and made four parts to every soldier apart. And also his coat, and that word coat means robe. Now the coat was without seam woven from the top throughout. I need to, I need to un let you understand something. This, uh, it, they call it a coat, but it's actually the inner garment. And this inner garment was made by the parents either the mother or the father, they made this garment. It was without seam. There was no sewed seams in it. It was just a one complete garment. You get, are you with me? It was complete. Okay? And, uh, and, and I don't know what color. The, the Bible doesn't say what color it is. Brother Gary, I think it was blue. I, I do. I think it was blue. I think the one Jesus was wearing was blue and there's a reason for me to think that and I'm going to show it to you amen so here he is wearing this fourth garment and this fourth garment is the the inner garment that was without seam it was the seamless garment now listen to this Exodus chapter 26 verse 1 moreover thou shalt make the tabernacle with the ten curtains of fine twine linen white and blue and purple and scarlet with cherubims of cunning work shalt thou make them do you see that now imagine if you would we're talking about the holy of holies we're talking about a place only where the high priest can go amen and in that tabernacle they carry around with them a, a veil and that veil hung over the holy of holies and on the, in that veil, it was white and scarlet and blue and purple. And isn't it amazing to you that Jesus wore four robes before he went to the cross? Amen. Now, I can't prove it was blue. I just believe it was. I believe God was in it. Amen. I believe God was in it. What was behind that veil was the presence of God. That high priest went in one time a year and put blood on that mercy seat. But when Jesus died on the cross, they tore that veil in two. <laughs> Amen. And he went into the heavenlies and went one time and put his blood on that mercy seat and sat down on the right hand of the Father. I don't know about you, but that just blesses me. Now I'm going to give you some truths about this, this garment. This speaks of our Savior who came from heaven for us. Amen. He came from his rightful places in heaven.
And he came. I like, if you ever get a chance to, listen to B.R. Lakin's message on the bitter cup. Those old preachers had a way of speaking that would just bless your blesser. I mean, it just help you. And he, he talks about Jesus stepping off the portals of heaven and, and stooping down and coming down here to man and becoming flesh and dying on the cross and going back to that place where he, was, where he belonged. Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 17 says, Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible. Whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And when he wore that seamless robe and they got down to that part where he had that seamless robe on, that means that everything is complete in Christ Jesus. Amen. There's no seams there. There's no division there. There was no division between the Father and the Son. The Father decided before the earth was ever created that the Son would be the one that come and die for me and you. Amen. And so when he stood there in that seamless robe, he was showing the world, I, there was no division between me and the Father. I have come. To, but, but by the Father's will to come and die for all the world. Amen? Amen. This room, this robe was usually worn and by the Son and was highly treasured because the mother usually made it. But let me, let me give you something. I, I, I hadn't seen this before. Let me give you this. Luke chapter 15, verse 22. You know that verse? That's the prodigal as he's coming home. Listen what the Father said. But the Father said unto the servants, Bring forth the best robe. You know what I believe that was? I believe that was that seamless robe that his mother made him. And when he put that robe on that son, he knew he was a son. And friend, when we see Jesus wearing that robe, that speaks to us of eternal salvation. We're sons of God. We're children of God. And listen to me, when he wore that robe, he said, what I win will be mine and it'll stay mine. It's complete. I don't understand why people believe in an incomplete salvation. We have a salvation that's sure and steadfast. Amen. And we, we have a salvation that's complete in Christ Jesus. And so when he wore that robe, he let us know that he had on the best robe and that best robe was warned to let us know that we're saved and eternally saved. Now, I want you to turn one more time and look over in Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1, we get a beautiful picture of the Lord Jesus Christ as, uh, as, as John turned and uh, to see the voice that spoke to him. Listen to this. And look in verse number 12. The Bible says, And I turned to see the voice which spake with me, being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks, and in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were a flame of fire, and his feet like unto brass, as if, if, uh, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound. Of many waters. Now, let me give you this, and I'll be through. That's that last robe that we'll see, and that's the glory of God. That's the judge that will stand. Listen to me. Listen to me. Revelation chapter 20 says, All that are not saved will stand at the great white throne one day, and they'll stand before Jesus Christ as their judge. He died for you, but He'll judge you one day if you don't get saved. Amen. He'll judge you one day if you don't get saved. And the Bible says everybody that stood before that great white throne was cast in the lake of fire. Everybody. Not one was rescued. You know when the time of rescue is? Right now. Right now. The Bible says now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. I believe this. I believe somebody. Listen, the Lord's been here all day. And I believe somebody needs to come and get saved. Amen. Let me ask you something. Let me ask you something. I said yesterday, and I had several people comment about this, but children have a right to be saved. Young people have a right, adults have a right to be saved. You say, I don't know about that. Well, the Lord didn't tell us to pray that he would save them. He's already did that. 
He's already went to the cross. Your sacrifice has already been made. Amen? And listen to this. He said he was not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So, Brother Don, he's, he's already stated the fact how he feels. Let me ask you a question. Are you willing for one to perish? I'm not willing for one to perish. I'm so not willing. I got up before daylight and prayed and asked God to speak to, speak to hearts. I'm, I'm so not willing. I'm willing to go drive a van myself if I need to. I'm so not willing that if, if all you adults left, I'd still be bringing kids. I, I am so not willing that I'm willing to come today and pray that God would convict a heart and show a lost sinner He wore those robes for Him to show Him that He was dying for our sin and that if they'll come and trust Him by faith, He'll save them. Now there, there's the prayer. Show them in their hearts. Show them that they need to be saved. Are you willing for one to perish? One. Not one. No, not one. Would you come? I'm going to ask everybody to stand. If you're here and you're lost, you ought to come to the altar tonight, this morning. Come to the altar. How about you? Would you come and pray? Would you come and ask the Father this morning to speak to a heart? You don't have to ask Him if He'll save them. He will save them. Would you come and ask God to speak to a heart? Show them in their own hearts their eternity as they stand now. Show them in their hearts that they can be saved if they'll come and trust Him by faith. Would you come? Would you come? If it was your children, would you be willing that one perish? If it was your grandchildren, would you be willing that one perish? Would you come this morning with a heavy heart and say, God, convict hearts and show them? Listen, if you're lost here this morning, there's people praying for you. They prayed for you already this morning before they came. And they're praying now and they're asking for you to come. How about you? Would you come? you come you're not saved you need to be saved would you come yes amen you this morning for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son how about you would you come this morning God commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners Christ died for us would you come this morning would you come this morning um would you come 